North Carolina lawmakers who support the state's new voter ID law say the reforms are common sense protections, but the law is hugely controversial. Republican Governor Pat McCrory signed the bill into law this week. It requires voters to have state-issued IDs and imposes other new restrictions. Joining me now is Brad Coker. He is the managing director of Mason Dixon Polling and Research. He is here to weigh in. Uh, Brad, thanks so much for being here uh, from Florida. Tell me this, what does this new bill, and it's pretty massive, it's not just voter ID uh, laws, what does it actually mean for voters in North Carolina? Well, certainly uh, it's going to make the process of uh, voting uh, a little bit more difficult perhaps for some people. Uh, but uh, it, it's you have to wait and see. Uh, sometimes these things are overstated in terms of their impact, and and certainly it's going to put a little more pressure on the Democratic ground machine uh, to uh, organize a little bit harder to uh, make sure that folks have the right IDs when they go to the polls. That's right, and it doesn't co go into effect until 2016, so they've got some time to do that. What does demographically? What does North Carolina look like now? Well, it's certainly evolved. Um, I mean, the, the, the black population has not really increased all that much. What you've seen is an increase in black voter registration, and then the Obama ground game uh, has been able to turn those voters out in, right. in large numbers. So with the African-American community, it's been more about registration and turnout, uh, which Obama was able to do uh, very successfully both in 2008 and 2012. The real demographic change is taking place around Raleigh-Durham, the so-called research triangle area, where you have a large number of out-of-state, non-Southern uh, people moving in there, and right. uh, they're, they're, they're much more progressive than uh, people who lived in Raleigh 20, 25 years ago. I mean, if you recall, Raleigh was Jesse Helms' hometown. Um, and now Raleigh, of course, is uh, much, much more democratic than other parts of the state. Right. Is it your sense that it looks, because I'm actually from the South, and, and people sort of talk about the Old South uh, versus the New South. Is it your sense that, Nor that North Carolina looks more like South Carolina or more like Virginia in terms of politically? Uh, definitely more like Virginia. I mean, you can almost compare Raleigh-Durham to Northern Virginia, okay. and it's the same type of voter moving into both places, highly educated, whites, that necessarily, uh, you know, they're not culturally conservative like uh, old Southerners are in, in most cases. Right, and, and so this um, sweeping bill that was passed in a law, there was some polling out, it was a Democratic polling firm, showed that 50% uh, are against this law, 39% uh, support it. Uh, here is what Governor McCrory had to say about it after he signed it into law. Let me be direct. Many of those from the extreme left who have been criticizing photo ID are using scare tactics. They're more interested in divisive politics than ensuring that no one's vote is disenfranchised by a fraudulent ballot. Protecting the integrity of every vote cast is among the most important duties I have as governor. And it's why I sign these common sense, commonplace protections into law. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how McCrory fits in more generally into Southern governors and the trends that are going on there. Uh, he's not actually the most conservative Southerner out there, certainly not on the level of a Rick Perry. Um, I think he's walking a, a bit of a tightrope on this one because he really ran as a businessman, right. uh, fiscal conservative. Former mayor of Charlotte. Yeah, he, he didn't really run as a, as a rural social conservative, uh, but on some of these issues, uh, the majority in his party support this, and he really needs to more or less go along. And um, I don't know that these laws are quite as, uh, I don't think the opposition to these are quite as strong as that poll suggested. I've seen in most Southern states where it, it, it's at worst a 50-50 split. Um, in some cases, uh, actually, a majority have supported it. So, 
tell you. I don't know yeah. how big of a risk this is, although particularly since it's being put off till 2016. Yeah, and it does seem like people generally agree that there should be some sort of voter ID law. I think the question is whether or not people agree that that uh, early voting should be cut and you know cut by a week and and some of the other changes that are going on there. Do you you talked about oh, the Obama effect there in in, a, in the sense that there was this grassroots push there and it uh, encouraged African Americans to, to come out to vote. Is there also sort of a reverse Obama effect going on in the South at all? Sort of a backlash, if you will? Well, yes and no. I, I, I think that, uh, you know, there has been some turnout. Uh, let, let me put it to you this way. In the two elections where Barack Obama was actually on the ballot and he carried the state very narrowly the first time and uh, lost it very narrowly the second time. The turnout was there. But if you look at the off-year election, uh, the 2010 election and, and the upcoming election next year, it's very hard to replicate that turnout if Obama himself is not on the ballot. Right. And a, a perfect example of that is if you look at the Georgia race in 2008, um, there was a large black turnout, so, so much that Saxby Chambliss was not able to get 50% of the vote. He only won by a couple percentage points over the Democrat. And uh, so he was forced into a runoff a couple of weeks later. Well, of course, Obama had already been elected. The incentive wasn't there for black voters to come out. Right. And in the runoff, Chambliss won by 16 points. And the difference between the two elections was that big drop in voter turnout amongst black voters. So the question moving forward for the Democratic Party is can they continue to turn out black voters in those huge numbers without Barack Obama right. at the top of the ticket. And that'll be what's interesting to see first in the midterm election coming up and then again in the next presidential election where um, I don't know that there's a viable African-American candidate who's going to be Cory Booker, ticket. of course. What about well, him? Booker, just... Booker, Booker's an outside shot at yeah, best. Yeah, uh, it... So I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule him out, but I don't know. That, 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 the odds of that are probably not that great, although I would have said the same thing about Obama 10 years yeah, ago. Yeah, and you feel like Hillary Clinton has some mending of the fences to do with African Americans uh, post some of the things that went on in South Carolina uh, around her husband talking about, uh, you know, sort of framing Obama as a race candidate. Uh, so I think she has some, and you, you heard her out. She's been speaking in front of large crowds, large African American crowds and getting uh, some applause there. What do you, I mean, there are some races, uh, none is running in Georgia. You've got a Democrat uh, in Kentucky who's also running. Are, I mean, is the Democratic label strong enough uh, to sort of bring forward some sort of Democratic resurgence in uh, in these southern states? Um, it's interesting because at one level you see that the, at least the, the presidential numbers tightening up uh, and the Democrats are becoming more competitive in these states at the presidential level. But on the other side, you're seeing Republicans carrying and gaining larger majorities right. in state legislatures. And I think the voting uh, ID uh, law that just passed, uh, this was the first time I believe Republicans have controlled both houses of the North Carolina legislature with a Republican governor. Yeah, I think uh, in like so, a, in a century or something. Yeah, so yeah. you've got these counter currents running, uh, one suggesting that certain parts of the South are becoming more blue. Uh, but then you get down to the local level and they seem to be becoming more red. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it really depends on cycles and who's running and uh, candidate qualities. Um, you know, the Senate race in North Carolina would be interesting. I think Kay Hagan benefited last time with Obama on the ticket and, and Liddy Dole had some issues. Right. Now she has a, a voting record to defend. She doesn't have Obama at the top of the ticket. Um, so, you know, I, I think we'll her re-election race. What about happen. Latinos in the South? It seems to me that that's a real growth area, too. Uh, if you look at some of the, the polling and the demographics in South Carolina, for instance, or, you know, and still not a huge population, but it's certainly growing. How do they fit into the mix and the, the Southern demographics and political wins? Well, certainly the, you know, the Democrats are going to target them and try to turn them out. There's still a big discrepancy between Hispanic population and Hispanic vote. Uh, it lags much, you know, there's a much larger lag there than there is with African Americans. The one state where the Hispanic vote I think has become more significant has been Georgia. 
Um, right. Okay. It, it's almost four or five percent of the vote now, whereas you know it was maybe one or two percent 15 years ago. So Georgia is sort of the first state where you sort of take a look at that. I think the others are lagging. Maybe Northern Virginia, you're seeing increased Hispanic vote as well. Yeah. But that's all really coming out of the Washington suburbs. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for no chatting problem. with me today. I learned a lot. Okay, have a good one. All right, take care, Brad. The new voter ID law will make it more difficult for one specific demographic of voters, specifically college students. Masak Dalui is the campus coordinator for Common Cause North Carolina, and his job now is to educate students on this new law. Uh, Masak, thanks so much for being here. What's your sense of, of what the difference is now? What will college kids have to do that they didn't have to do before? Well, North Carolina has over a, qu a, a quarter of a million students here. And so what they'll have to do differently is that they'll need an alternate voter ID in order for them to vote. That means they'll have to go to your driver motor vehicle um, office with four different forms of identification just in order for them to be able to get an alternate ID in order for them to vote. And so what are you trying to do? And, and tell me also, what has the reaction been to this law? Well, there, we're finding that a lot of students are upset. They're upset, they're confused as to why lawmakers and their representatives are making it more difficult uh, for students to get involved. A large portion of these students are first time voters. Um, so they know very little about voting or about getting involved. And so for them, you think that um, those that they're voting for should be encouraging them to get involved with the process and making it as accessible and as easy as possible. However, they're finding that that's not, that's not what's happening right here in our state. In fact, they feel as though they're being disenfranchised and their voice is being suppressed. And, what are, and you're trying to do what? Go around the state and, and talk to them about these new laws, which won't go into effect until 2016. Yes, what we're doing is we're just, um, we're continuing to do what we've been doing, but there's a large emphasis or strong, a big emphasis on um, education this time around. We have to make sure that we're having these conversations with these universities about how we can make, ensure that their students can continue to take advantage of democracy. And so we're, we're starting those conversations and we're also strategizing as to, um, you know, how we can ensure that their students get an alternate ID or what other um, means we can utilize to make sure that students can um, cast a ballot in the upcoming elections. You talked about those 250,000 uh, college students in North Carolina and polls show in terms of the youth vote, vote in 2008, 74% of those folks voted for Obama between 18 and 29 year olds and 67% in 2012. Do people look at this as these new voter ID laws as, as just a political move or, or what's their sense of it? Yeah, uh, uh, the, the belief is that um, there is voter fraud, and that's why they've um, they passed this new law. However, students, there's no proof that shows that students have committed any form of voter fraud. Um, and so, what we've been doing is we've just trying to identify, you know, what ways in which these students can get involved, and what ways in which they can reach out to their um, representatives and and just continue to to involve them as much as possible. Is it your sense that this actually will be a real impediment? There, there have been some studies that show that there isn't really much of an effect in terms of who shows up at the polls, these voter ID laws that are, quite frankly, um, uh, supported by majorities of folks. Well, I, I'll say this. I've, I've been doing this work for um, a little over a year now where we're um, working with students on voter um, registration and, and things of that nature. And yes, it will be a big hindrance. There's, always, there's already this belief that students and young people are apathetic to politics and what's going on around them, when in fact, you know, they, they're very much interested in getting involved, except one, a lot of them are first time voters, um, they're just getting used to, um, you know, this new responsibility. And so for them, if, if we're putting so much more obstacles or steps in the way of them actually getting registered to vote and being able to practice that right, then what it does is it discourages them. You can remember when you were 18 or you know just starting college, 
the last thing you were thinking about was, yes, I need to have my social security card on me and these other forms of, uh, of identification in order for me to vote. You were thinking about the new people you had to meet and, and the right. classes and the academics that you need to be focused on. Yeah. And so when you were, because I do remember when I was 18, it was many, many years ago. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it was e it was pretty easy to vote. I think I just was able to use your college ID, use your dorm, uh, your dorm address, and and that's not going to happen now. No, no, that's not going to happen now. Now we're the only state out of all the states that have um, passed a bill that um, requires people to show their ID. We're the only state that has. Um, that does not allow for students to use their student identification card, nor can they use their out-of-state um, identification. It has to be this alternate uh, form of identification in order for the students to get involved. Right, that you, and you have to go to the DMV. My goodness, who wants to go to the DMV for anything? Right, and so you look at it, and it's, it's a process. It takes time. You'll and will it be, but it won't be extra money, right? These, these IDs will be free, but it's, it, it's sort of costly in terms of time spent. Yes, it's costly. These ID, this identification will be um, cost free. However, you will be, need to be able to get to the closest DMV um, that's in your location, as well as you'll need to be able to identify where um, the four document, um, yeah. documents that are being required are. You mean, I mean... You know, honestly, some students may not have their birth certificates yeah. um, or these other forms of identification that they'll need. And so we want to continue to make sure that these students um, have everything they need in order to be able to take advantage of that. Masek, thank you so much for talking to me today. Good luck with all of your efforts. Thank you. I appreciate, appreciate your sentiments.